So the motivation of our shouting is all important because when you take scripture out of context, you may find yourself uh, shouting for the wrong reasons. And so today I want us to be uh, in the book of Luke and really the, the backdrop of this is found in Luke the 19th chapter 24 through 40, but we're gonna pluck out a few verses as we look at some very important topics uh, re regarding why we should shout for the Lord. Uh, the life of Jesus, you may recall, was marked by contrast. You know, some liked him and some did not. And in the beginning of his ministry, uh, he operated in obscurity. Many people didn't know who he was until word got out about him. However, as the news of his power and the news of his claims to be the Messiah spread, people began to flock around him. He became popular. Uh, they were drawn by the excitement of his miracles and the uniqueness of his preaching. They had never heard any preaching like this before, such boldness uh, and such confidence. And uh, by the second year of his ministry, Jesus was thrown with crowds of people. Everywhere he traveled, people came. Now, these crowds were with him until he began to preach uh, the message of extreme commitment as found in John 6. That happens quite a bit when people come to church, they're excited about being in the church, excited about being amongst a group of people, maybe a part of a family, until commitment to service is emphasized. And so uh, by the time Jesus reached the end of his ministry, some three years later, the crowds were composed of those who were committed to following him, as well as some in the crowd uh, were comprised of those who were violently opposed to his teachings. Because you may recall the religious elite got pretty upset by his popularity. And even among his own, his 12 disciples, his inner circle, there was Judas who was plotting his own uh, agenda. And there were times when the crowd would be fickle. I want you to remember that word fickle. That means to be wavering. Uh, that, that means to be unstable. And what we're really noticing, and it's not really emphasized on Palm Sunday, the fickleness of Palm Sunday, the fickle faith of Palm Sunday. That's weak and wavering faith. Never more so than the last week after he entered Jerusalem. As Jesus reached the last week of his life on earth, the crowds, yeah, they were still there. Uh, but it's interesting that these crowds that surrounded Jesus during his last week of his earthly ministry, they were often engaged in a lot of shouting. Many times we go to church, we see people, sometimes we see them shouting. We may not know what they're shouting about, but we need to kind of emphasize and inspect why we really shout. Uh, and so people that were following Jesus, they would shout often. And this morning, that's what I want to talk about. I want you to join me as we travel back in time with Jesus to those three major events in his life during his last week of ministry. In all three of these events, you'll see that the crowds were shouting in the presence of the Lord. Now when we shout, we're in the presence of the Lord, it should be a happy shout, it should be a joyful shout, it should be a confident shout that God might be blessed and His will may be done. But all of these events lead up to that day when the shouting stopped. You know, the shouting actually stopped after He was crucified. But all of these events lead up to the day when the shouting stopped. And that is what I want us to focus on. And all of our attention the day the shouting stopped. Uh, we'll see that there was quite a bit of shouting going on uh, when he entered uh, Jerusalem. As you see in your head out there, the crowd shouted at his entrance. And then guess what? Uh, uh, a few days later, the crowd shouted at his examination or really his interrogation. And then finally the crowds, they were shouting during his execution even. They didn't finally stop shouting until after he was dead. So let's see what brought all of this about. If you turn your Bibles to the Apostle Luke, we're going to be in chapter 19, and as I said, the backdrop of that is really verses 24 through 40, but time will allow us to go through all that, so I want to give you the highlights. And as we go to uh, Luke here, he has something to say about this very specific event that took place, and how it really uh, factored in that the shouting would eventually stop. And as we go to Luke, we're in Luke, the 19th chapter, verse 37. Uh, God has a quotation here that is really prophecy that's being lived out throughout our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, because if you know him, he was a prophet, a priest, and a king. 
And I'll read for your consideration from the New American Standard, uh, verse 37, it says, Now as soon as he was approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, this is after he left Bethany, this is after he sent the disciples into Jerusalem to get him a coat and bring it back to him, and so that he would ride in like a humble king. As soon as he was approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of the disciples uh, began to praise God joyfully, with a loud voice for all the miracles they had seen. And they're joyfully praising him, but why? Because they're excited about the miracles that they had seen. It said in verse 38, and they are really, uh, the words that they're saying, they're fulfilling prophecy. And this prophecy comes from Psalm 118, verse 26. And just so you won't be caught off guard and you realize where this fits in, uh, this statement of these words are really to be applied in the millennial reign of Christ, but they want freedom right now from the Romans. And so they're shouting, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. You'll find that very same quotation in Psalm 118, verse 26. So why the crowds shouting? Why all the excitement? Well, they had experienced the excitement of watching his miracles uh, prior to him entering Jerusalem. Also, they were excited about the messenger, this uh, word of enlightenment that he was sharing with everyone, and also they were excited about the prophecy, the expectation of a Messiah that would come. And so we're still in verse 37 here. Prophecy is being fulfilled, but they're misapplying the time period. So, they're excited about Jesus the man, Jesus the messenger, and Jesus the Messiah. As soon as he was approaching near the city of Jerusalem, the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice. Uh, were they looking for the Jesus of the Bible or were they looking for their own Jesus? People come to church looking for different types of Jesuses. Did you know that? Everybody don't come to church looking for the Jesus of the Bible. They come to church looking for Jesus to speak on their truth, not the truth. The Bible says he's the way, the truth, and the life. We must seek the biblical Jesus. So, in verse 37, we see Jesus the man. They're excited about the miracles that he has previously done, the miracles and the power they had seen him demonstrate prior to entering Jerusalem. You know, he even raised Lazarus from the dead. And so here, word has gotten out. Some in the crowd were genuinely in love with the Lord for him speaking the truth, and others were there because of what they had seen him do. And people are still interested in Jesus for what they have seen him do. You may have seen him bless somebody else. You say, well, he probably can bless me. But have you surrendered to the Lord yet? Is the question. Everybody wants something for Jesus, but they really don't want to serve him. So they only want the miracles and the excitement. Just because they love the miracles does not mean that they're saved. Just because they love the power that he has and they applaud that does not mean that they're saved. So they, they come to see Jesus the man that is imbued with all his power. They also, some in the crowd, uh, they are excited and shouting because they see Jesus the messenger. They've heard him speak before like no other man has ever spoken. And so uh, they had experienced this enlightenment from him. A lot of times people go to church because they, they may have a pastor or a preacher and he speaks so well, so eloquently, so poetically, but they really don't get the message of God. They may leave church with a lot of Kool-Aid and good feelings, but they have not let God's word settle in their soul. They have not let, God, let God's word take root, but they felt real good. Because I've been to some churches before and I felt real good, but I didn't have anything to hold me for the rest of the week. And so God says, be careful while you are applauding the message. Some were there shouting because of the radical teachings they had heard Jesus giving. He was different. And some people just like different. They, they, sometimes it doesn't even matter what the other person is saying. They said, I just want something different. No, you should want the truth. You should always value the truth. Be truth seekers and lie detectors. Be truth seekers and lie detectors. We're in this mess in this country today because the majority of the Christians are not truth seekers. And they're easily led astray. The only thing that holds up false teachers are his followers. The only thing that holds up false teachers are his followers, even when they know the truth and deny it. But the truth is still the truth. So he was different, and they were drawn to him. 
Uh, that's what it says in John 6, 47. It talks about that. And there is still that crowd that flocks to the unusual. He was unusual. He was not just different. He was unusual. And some people can hear someone who is a, a little bit different from them. And, and, and they, they act like they've heard from an angel now. It's, it's something new. I was bored. Be careful about being around people that get bored real easy. People that get bored easy, they open to almost anything. You know, people that say don't think, I'll try anything once. Maybe, maybe the one time that you lose your life. You try the wrong drug the wrong time and you're done. Now, I'll try anything once. Please don't be a part of that crowd. Uh, be looking for the truth. Be looking for something to fill the void that's in your life. And God knows exactly what that is. That's his word. So the Bible tells us, blessed is the man who hungers and thirsts for righteousness, for he will be filled. He will be satisfied. That's what God has promised to do, to satisfy any kind of void in your life. It says, come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, in Matthew 11, 28-30. He says, and I will give you rest. So they were there shouting when he entered Jerusalem because of the excitement from the, from the miracles, from the enlightenment he was giving them, the, a different message. But also, they were there uh, because of the expectation of a promised Messiah. But what kind of Messiah were they looking for? Uh, what, what, what kind of Messiah? They had these expectations as he, uh, he, he arrived in Jerusalem. Well, uh, today is Palm Sunday. And a lot of people are going to church today because it's one of those traditional Sundays that you go, you know, along with Easter and, and uh, Christmas, Mother's Day, Father's Day, one of those traditional days. Uh, not so much to hear what God has to say, but it's something to check off the box to say, well, I've been religious at least two or three times this year. I go to church. They may want to tell somebody that. But that's not why you should be attending church. So today is Palm Sunday, and any day you're in church to hear God's word is a good day. Today is the day we commemorate our Lord's triumphant entry into the city of Jerusalem almost 2,000 years ago. And for the disciples of Jesus, this was a day of great expectation and excitement and joy. However, however, for our Lord, it was a day of disappointment and heartbreak. It was a day of disappointment and heartbreak. He said, why do you say that? They say, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us now. Uh, praise the Lord. How could that be a day of heartbreak? Because he knew they were looking for a different kind of king. They were looking for somebody to take them from under Roman rule and occupation. They weren't looking for a spiritual king. They weren't looking for somebody to save their souls. They were looking for relief. They weren't looking to repent. See, repentance doesn't mean you cry out. Repentance means you're willing to change. Repentance doesn't mean you just cry out and shout. Everybody shouts in pain. You twist your ankle the right way, you, you cry out, oh God. People cry out, oh God, for different reasons. But the question is, are you willing to change and turn your life over to the Lord? And so it was a day of disappointment for our Lord. Uh, they had consistently refused to believe his claims. Even when he went to that, he says a, 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 a person is not even welcome in his own hometown. A prophet is not welcome even in his own hometown. Uh, there were very few miracles that our Lord performed in Nazareth because the majority of the people there rejected his message. And so God is telling us here, be careful while you're shouting. Make sure you are under the right motivation. This was a day when Jesus drew the line in the sand. That's why he came to Jerusalem. Uh, when he appeared on that donkey riding from the Mount of Olives, there was no doubt as to what he was doing. Prophecy was being fulfilled. And he was revealing himself as the Messiah of Israel. At this great event, you're going to notice something here, that the multitudes are shouting, they're lifting up their voices in praise of the Lord. They know scripture, but do they believe scripture? Can they apply scripture the right way? They know exactly what the Lord is doing. And they're certain that he has come to deliver Israel from the bondage of Rome. They're thinking about right here, right now. Rome, not deliverance of my soul. Don't deliver me from sin, but deliver me from my oppression. See, a lot of people, when they pray, that uh, they, they don't really want to be delivered from sin. They want to be delivered from their pain, from their difficult situation. That's not the deliverance they're looking for. That's why we need to understand what repentance is. Repentance doesn't mean you cry out. Repentance means you're willing to change and let God change you. So therefore, they cheered him and they shouted, praise to God because of him. Hosanna in the heights. Verse 11, this particular verse in verse 37 and 38 speaks volumes about the prophecy that was made about our Lord on this day. Sadly, they miss the entire significance of this event. They too, way back when, over 2,000 years, they went to church and they missed God. They went to church and they missed God. Now it's true that Jesus came 
uh, in fulfillment of the prophecy of the prophet Zechariah. In Zechariah 9, 9, it said that he would ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. He would ride in as a king, a humble king, not on a stand as a military ruler. Uh, he, and he is also telling us here that, that uh, because he's riding in and claiming his messiahship, the Jewish leaders will be upset. And he's been more popular than ever at this point in time. And now they really plan to kill him. They plan to kill him though after Passover because he's so popular right now. And uh, it's important to see that the reason Jesus came to Jerusalem was for the sole purpose of going to Calvary to die for the sins of all mankind. To go to Calvary. He, Calvary was a marketplace where he purchased our sins. He struggled up a hill. He had no money to give. But that old rugged cross was laid on him and he sacrificed his life for you and me. So that's why he really came. He, he let man and his evil machinations continue to flow and have their way. You know, he allowed this to take place in order to fulfill prophecy. That's what it talks about in Isaiah 50 and 7. There many scriptures talk about why he came in this way. And that's what John 18 and 37 speaks to as well. They, the people, the crowd, uh, shouted at his entrance to Jerusalem. But they didn't understand that there was more to the story. Like that program used to come on and this is the rest of the story. Those who knew him, they knew that he was there for a reason. And that's why they were shouting, they were there to praise him. They knew that he was the assigned savior of their souls. And so we see, they shouted when he entered. But were they shouting for the right reasons? We move to our second outline. It says the crowd shouted at, at his examination. Now, you see, things begin to change uh, during that week. And if you go over to the book of John, and what I love about the Apostle John, the Apostle John is primarily focused on the deity of Jesus Christ, the fact that he is the Son of God. Not only is he the King of kings and Lord of lords, but he is the Son of God. And in John 19, if you turn there with me, uh, God is going to show us how the crowds, they're still shouting, but they had a different kind of shout now. They went from a shout of joy uh, to a shout of anger. And they went from a shout of joy to a shout of anger. Some people still get mad at the Lord that they, they, he didn't do exactly what they want him to do. You know, you got some people who won't go to church anymore because they're mad at God about how things turn out in their lives for themselves or for their loved ones. They've totally excluded God's plans. That God's ways are not our ways. But God has the best plan that we could ever come up with. So we are in John, uh, the 19th chapter, and we see the crowd shouted at his examination. Now it really should be his inter interrogation. It's a different kind of shout because he didn't get rid of the Romans right away. He didn't save them. Uh, they're beginning to turn on him. And of course the religious elite, they're beginning to have their way. They've been paying people off to come against the Lord. But this is all part of God's plan. Uh, be sure you're shouting for the right reasons. That's what we're talking about today. And so as we get to John, the 19th chapter, verses 13 through 16, and I'll read that so you can have some context here. And it says in verse 13, John 19 and 13, Therefore, he's come before Pilate. And keep in mind, you know, Pilate's wife had told him, have nothing to do with Jesus. I had a, had a dream about this man. Uh, I know the, the Jews want to kill him. They brought him before you, but please have nothing to do with this man. So Pilate comes up with a scheme. At this time of year, uh, they normally let a prisoner go. So Pilate was trying to give them a choice between Jesus, the most innocent man that's ever lived, and Barabbas, who was murder incorporated. He had Barabbas, who was a, a career criminal and a murderer. He is going to bring him out before the people and say, whom do you choose? Whom do you choose? Jesus or Barabbas? Because uh, Pilate didn't want this on his conscience. And now we're going to see the people say, if you choose uh, Jesus over Barabbas, you're choosing a rebel. And this guy says he's a king, so you're against Caesar. So Pilate, he created like any man that has no character. He says in verse 13, it says, that, Therefore, when Pilate heard these words, what it said recently, and the, the verse before that says, Everyone who makes himself out to be a king opposes Caesar. And so when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Uh, now, it was the day of preparation for the Passover. It was about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, Behold your king. 
Pilate threw up his hands. He says, Behold your king. Uh, verse uh, 15, it says, So they cried out, Away with him. Away with him. Crucify him. We're talking about a week after Palm Sunday. You know, we, we like to celebrate Palm Sunday, but Palm Sunday is talking about the fickle faith of the crowd. The wavering faith of the crowd. They didn't have any firm faith. They had fickle faith because they wanted what they wanted right there and right there. And so the crowd cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. Oh, have mercy. When they come before the Lord, he's going to play that tape back for them. We have no king but Caesar. Finally, in verse 16, it says, so he, Pilate, the weak one, the spineless one, he then handed him over to be crucified. He handed him over to be crucified. Crucified. When you go back to verse 15, they underline the phrase, but it says, they cried out. They cried out. They shouted. They cried out. The word cried out means to scream or to demand for something to be done. They demanded that Jesus Christ be crucified. They demanded that he die the death of the most cruelest criminal on earth. They cried out. And this crowd is whipped up into a frenzy, as you see. Uh, so much so that nothing but the blood of Jesus could satisfy them. Nothing but the blood of Jesus could satisfy Not to die for their sins, but to kill them horrifically. And here's some of the same crowd that shouted last Sunday, a shouting for his death during his trial before Pilate. This is what happened seven days after Palm Sunday, the fickle faith of Palm Sunday. You need to understand there was a lot of shouting going on. This crowd is very fickle. And when this man, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the God man, whom they supposed to be the Messiah, didn't act as they thought he should, they wrote him off as an imposter. They wrote him off as an imposter. And this is why we find some of the same people who were calling him king a week before, as he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, now are crying for his blood. One week later. So ask yourself, why the sudden change? Why the sudden change? Well, you see on your hand out there, look how they consider him now. No longer Hosanna, the one who could save us, but they saw him as what? An imposter? They saw him as an instigator? They saw him as an intruder. Why did they see our Lord in such light? Well, let's go back to them seeing him as an imposter. Uh, they say they see him as an imposter because he did not overthrow Rome. He didn't do as they willed him to do. Uh, he didn't give them the immediate relief. Now our God is a just God. He may not be the God of immediate justice, but he is a God of ultimate justice. Whatever you're going through in life, it doesn't matter if you've been betrayed or misused or mishandled by someone, you better believe that God is still on your side. He's going to handle it in his time. It's about God timing, God's timing, not ours. So, so they wanted him to overthrow Rome. And this was the Jewish expectation concerning the promised Messiah. They had assigned their own meaning for the Messiah. So, so they hated him and they shouted against him because they saw him now as an imposter. Because they didn't understand scripture. Keep in mind, what they shouted out uh, uh, was a prophecy that is uh, related over in Psalm 118 verse 26. And that relates to the millennial reign. When God comes back at the second coming and he has Jerusalem uh, to be the number one nation in the world and to highlight and set up his kingdom. But they saw him as an imposter. Number two, uh, they considered him to be an instigator. To be an instigator because he defied the other rulers there. He didn't bow down to anyone. He only answered uh, the command of the Father. He was there to carry out the Father's plan, not man's plan. If you turn your Bibles there to John 11, John 11, verse 49 and uh, 52, we're going to see why they saw him as an instigator, uh, because he would not kowtow uh, to their will and to their way. And God has said, everything that you want to find out, the answers that you need to have because of what is transpiring in your life and what's transpired in the life of Jesus is found in Scripture. It says, verse 49, but one of them, Caiaphas, when he was given this kangaroo court, our Lord had six unjust trials, by the way. Uh, but one of them, Caiaphas, uh, uh, who was the high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you take into account that it is expedient. It is best for you that one man die for the people 
and that the whole nation not perish. Verse 51. Now he said, now he did not say this on his own initiative, but being high priest, that yeah, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation, but he didn't realize he was dying for the nation's sin. Finally, verse 52, it says, and not for the nation only, but in order that he might also gather together into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So they saw him as an imposter. They saw him as an instigator because they wouldn't follow uh, their plan. And because he defied the rulers of that day, the elite rulers as well as the Roman rulers, Jesus did not bow down under the authority of the priests and the scribes. So as opposed to saying, Hosanna in the highest, now they're saying, crucify him. So he defied the rulers. And our Lord is saying, uh, he possessed all the authority, much more authority than any elite religious leader or the Roman government. So they also saw him as an intruder. They saw him as an intruder as well. Why did they do that? Because he was against their religion. They had taken the Jewish faith and added all these other laws to it in order to prop themselves up. And the law had been put in place to show man that he was in need of a savior. That he could not fulfill the law. Jesus Christ fulfilled the law, and now he's getting ready to go to the cross to die for the sins of all mankind. But yet, it is their way and not God's way that they're concerned with. And he also claimed to be God, whom he was and whom he is. The high priests, when they heard him make this claim that he is God, they went, they rent their garments and they disqualified him. They said, I've heard more than enough. That's when they began to slap him, began to beat him. So, whether you know it or not, Jesus is still on trial in the hearts of men today. There's no in-between. Either you accept him as Savior or you don't accept him at all. God is saying that a decision needs to be made. This is not just something that took place in antiquity. It's something that is still relevant today. Whether you're a man or a woman, you have to make a choice. You are either in his corner or you're not in his corner. Even if you're in his circle, doesn't mean you're in his corner. You can be in church and still out of the family. It's important to know that you are in the right family. So God is trying to make it abundantly clear to us today, you cannot have it both ways. You're either for Jesus or you're against him. That's what the word of God tells us. Over in Matthew 12 and 30, as a matter of point, let us see what the word of God has to say about that. You having to make a decision. A decision needs to be made soon, not later. Because we always think we have tomorrow. Tomorrow may never come. Uh, God is saying there is such a thing as an unpardonable sin. The unpardonable sin is to reject the Holy Spirit revealing to you who Jesus Christ is. He who is not with me, that's in Matthew 12 and 30, says he who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. God says either you with my plan or you against my plan. Either you're drawing people to me or you're drawing people away from me. We have to make a decision today. Uh, that's why his whole life was a contrast. And he's making it abundantly clear here. Firm faith or fickle faith? God says if you're not saved, you're in jeopardy. He says if you are saved and your faith is fickle, you're drawing people away from me. And you're held accountable for that. Because you may be the only Bible any person ever sees. And God is saying, I want you to share the gospel first by your life and then by your words. What is your foundation is the question. Well, the Bible says something about that. 1 Corinthians 3.11 It says, no foundation can any man lay other than that which is Christ Jesus. So you're either with him or you're against him. Who's on the Lord's side is what the song says. Who is on the Lord's side? So if you're one of those who has not yielded to the Lord by trusting Jesus for salvation, God is saying you're part of that crowd that cries out against him, whether you say it or not. You know those people that say, well, yeah, I'm, I'm spiritual too. I, I got faith. I just keep it to myself as person. No, you're not with the Lord. You would say it and don't know it. You would say it. Find out. You need to, as we talked about this morning, uh, you need to come clean with God. You need to humble yourself. Uh, you need to yield yourself before the Lord. And so we see here, the verdict is going to be made. Jesus is on trial right now in the heart of man. And which side of the issue are you on? Here's the question. What is your verdict concerning your relationship with Jesus Christ? What is your verdict? Just because you shout doesn't mean you're saved. Just because you shout does not mean that you're saved. God is waiting for those that are not ashamed of the one that saved their soul. In Romans 1, 16 says, I'm not ashamed of the God who saved my soul, who gives salvation to the Jew first and then also to the Greek. 
Are you ashamed that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Well, the question is, why doesn't anybody know? Why doesn't anybody know? It, it, it doesn't have to be published. It doesn't have to be on the news. But somebody should know that you're a believer. If somebody charged you with being a Christian, would you be found guilty on all charges? Would you be found guilty? Or would you say, well, I'm not quite sure. I'm not with Jesus and I'm not with you. Well, you know the old story about how when Satan came down here and, and Jesus came and he told everybody that's in the crowd to come with me and Satan said, okay, the rest of y'all come with me. And there was one person on the fence and Satan said, come with me. And the guy said, no, 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 I'm not with him and I'm not with you. And Satan said, you don't understand. I own the fence. I own the fence. I'm the God of this world. If you were Jesus, you should have left a long time ago. And now that you're still here, you're with me even though you don't realize it. So a decision must be made. And the greatest lie that Satan has ever told is that you have more time. If you have more time, uh, uh, God calling home a young man just the other day is so, so evident that time is short. And Brother Dwayne Haskins, young man was NFL quarterback. Just, he was in town in Florida just working out, getting ready for the NFL season. Just walking across the street, got hit by a truck, 24 years old. 24 years old. You don't know. Tomorrow may never come. All you have is one day at a time. The Bible says today is a day of salvation. Yes. Why are you putting it off? Why are you putting it off? Because you're listening to a lie. And Satan is the father of lies. Yes. Satan is the father of lies. So we move to our last outline. We're talking about the fickle faith of Palm Sunday. And then finally the day of uh, shouting stop when they went and killed our Lord on the cross. And uh, then the shouting stopped and decisions had already been made. As we get to our last outline, we see it says the crowd shouted at his execution. They shouted at his entrance into Jerusalem. They shouted at his examination or his interrogation before Pilate. And now they are shouting now that they placed him on the cross. Uh, go with me over to Mark, the apostle Mark, uh, the gospel of Mark. And Mark has much to say about that. Uh, this execution that was placed upon our Lord, and really it was an execution that our Lord allowed to have happen, but that does not absolve those that were plotting for his death. This does not absolve those who made these evil plans uh, to plot against the Lord. And God is telling us the same thing. Many times God will allow us to go down difficult roads just so we can be in the right position so that he can bless us so that he can use us, that does not absolve the people that put you in that position. So don't worry about that. God's going to take care of those people. But God allowed this to happen so his prophecy could come true and he could pay the, the price that was needed to be paid and only he could pay it for our so great salvation. And so now we've gone past Jesus being before Pilate. And now we have him on the cross. We're in Mark, the 15th chapter, but really, Mark 25 through 37 covers the backdrop, and Mark 25 through 37 kind of gives you an idea of what was taking place on that day, and we'll get back to these last two verses. So I'll read for you Mark 15, verse 27, and it reads, and it says, They crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and he was numbered with transgressors, thief to his right, thief to his left. And Barabbas was set free. Can you imagine the most innocent person that ever lived in the world was given uh, the execution of a dangerous criminal? Uh, verse 29 said, those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads. This is, they were mocking him. This is almost like giving him the bird. You're in the car, they said wagging their heads. That's what it's equivalent to. They were wagging their heads and saying, Ha, uh, you who, who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Verse 30, save yourself and come down from the cross. They're shouting at him. Verse 31 says, In the same way the chief priests, the religious elite, also along with the scribes, were mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others, but he cannot save himself. One week after Palm Sunday. Verse 32 let this Christ, the King of Israel, now come down from the cross so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him were also insulting him. You know, initially both of these were making fun of him as well, but the one thief looked a little bit closer and recognized this man is the Son of God. He's not mad. He's not hurling insults against these people. He's genuine. He's the real deal. Verse 33, when the sixth hour came, darkness fell 
over the whole land until the ninth hour. When the sixth hour came, 12 o'clock noon, you went to see the Passion of the Christ and you remember it was just pitch black dark? That's because there's no cinematographer can show you the horror that our Lord went through when the Father judged him on the cross for our sins. Uh, we would all lose our minds if they could come up with a way to show that horror because it would never leave our minds. And it says that darkness fell over it. In verse 34 it says, At the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, in Aramaic, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because he was dying for your sins and my sins. That's why. 35, uh, when some of the bystanders heard it, they began saying, Behold, he is calling for Elijah. No, verse 36, some one ran and filled the sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave him a drink, saying, Let us see whether Elijah will come down, uh, come to take him down. And finally, verse 37, and Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last breath. He was dying, finishing up paying the price for our salvation on the cross. We're talking about how the crowds were still shouting during his execution. Still shouting. Look at that joyful shout from Palm Sunday. Then an angry shout uh, during his interrogation or his examination. And still, these hate-filled people are shouting during his execution. Why so much anger? It's amazing. All the horrors of death and all the indignities that were placed upon the Lamb of God, what he was subjected to. People are still looking for deliverance from the donkey and the elephant and have totally forgotten about the lamb. Yeah. We're on the wrong side of history. And so while the Lord Jesus had hung on the cross, the crowds all around him, they began to cry out. They mocked him. They, they ridiculed him. They falsely accused him. They even walked by, as I said before, wagging their heads. Now that was a sign of contempt and utter hatred. A sign of contempt and utter hatred for them to wag their heads at him. And even those men who were dying with him on the cross, they joined in with the crowd as they mocked the Lord Jesus. And by this time, the tolerance of this strange man with this strange message had turned into pure hatred. The most innocent man in the world had turned into pure hatred. <laughs> they wanted Jesus dead and they wanted his teachings to die with him. Oh, but he'll be victorious before all is said and done. Now, why so much anger? They misunderstood his mission. They misunderstood his message. And they misunderstood the methods that the Father was using to take him to the cross to die for our sins. So let's take a closer look at that as we just hone in on verses 29 and 30. Those passing by, verse 39, were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads. But what is going on here? They didn't understand the mission that he was on. He was on a mission from day one, and he put it into action when he turned 30 years old. Again, they were looking for a man who would overthrow Rome. Uh, they were looking for a revolutionary. No, he came here as a king of peace, a king to bring us close to the Father again. And so what they missed is that Jesus came not for revolt. That's not where he came, but he came for redemption. He did not come for revolt. He came for redemption, which we so badly needed. They were so busy looking for this Messiah who would usher in an earthly kingdom that they totally miss the Savior before their eyes. That's how you can come to church and miss God, looking for your God to apply your truth as opposed to God's truth. And so we see here this passage is very clear. And we often read that passage uh, during communion in Isaiah 53. We talk about the prophecy of the suffering servant. This is what our God, our God was actually acting out before them in real time. But this passage is clear in its teachings that the Messiah must die for the people. People still miss that today. You have to accept Jesus Christ as the only Savior in your life. The one that's only qualified to go to the cross to die for your sins. Born without an old sin nature, without spot and without blemish. The Son of God, only one that can pay the price for your sins. Jesus didn't come to this earth just simply to be an example. He didn't come simply to be a teacher. He didn't simply come to communicate truth. Why did he come? He came to be the savior of your soul. That's what people miss over and over again. Oh, they'll say Jesus, he was a grand teacher, he was a good teacher. No, he was the son of God, the only savior. He was a God man, 100% man and 100% deity. So he didn't come just to be a social reformer. 
who desire to simply lift people up uh, from their straits, Jesus came to this world to be the way, the truth, and the life. The way, the truth, and the life. You know, Satan came to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said, I came that you may have life. Not only have life, but have life abundantly. You have to make a choice. Which life are you choosing today? Did you understand Jesus' mission and why he came? He came for one purpose, and for one purpose only. He came to this world to die, that we might live. He came to die that we might live. That's the mission he was on. That's the mission many people still lose and miss out on today. He came to seek and to save the lost, says Luke 19 and 10. So they misunderstood his mission, and they also misapplied the Scripture's message. They misapplied Scripture. That's why it's good to be a part of a Bible teaching church, but if you don't apply it, you don't benefit from it. They had the law. We had the elite. You had the scribes. You had the chief priests. Uh, you had the Pharisees. They would study it all day, but they would misapply scripture. You are a sinner that needs a savior. Don't add to the word. Apply the word. Is what God is saying here. When Jesus came to this world, he came to a people and a nation that was very religious. A lot of pomp and circumstance, but they weren't interested in a relationship. They were very religious, but they were not relational. And God is interested in relational Christianity. If you don't get anything else, he's not interested in doctrinal Christianity. He's interested in relational Christianity. Because you can have all your doctrines right and still miss God. You got some seminarians in seminary that, that are going straight to hell because they never accepted Jesus Christ as that personal Savior. They're more concerned about how good they are at, at, at studying the scripture, how good they are about historical things, how good they are, how, how well versed they are in geographical things. They like to be known as experts in their field, but not an expert in their relationship with Jesus Christ. God says, what's your relationship like with my son? And so he came to people who knew the word of God and who were looking for the advent or the coming of the Messiah. However, in all the setting of the scripture, they totally missed Jesus. They were looking for this reformer, this great military leader who would overthrow their enemies and lead the Jewish people to a world dominance. It was all about them, about putting their people on top. He didn't come for the white race, the black race, the yellow. He came for the human race. He came to save all mankind. God says, what side of history are you on? Because they stumbled and they totally missed what the word of God had taught them. So remember that Jesus told them, uh, he said, now, from this time forward, God says, I'm, I'm coming to you, I'm promising you that I'm going to make a way for you to be saved for all eternity. He gave them that promise way back in uh, Genesis 3.15, in the Garden of Eden. And God says, if you remember this promise and you act upon this promise, you can be saved for all eternity. God said, now, just by me showing you I've got to slay an animal uh, for you to get back in my good graces, that means that blood has to be drawn. And my son has chosen to go to earth to die for your sins. He does not have to be a stumbling block today unless you allow him to be. Oh yeah, it's good to come and celebrate Palm Sunday. Hosanna, Hosanna, uh, his highest. Yes, save us now. That's what God wants to do. He wants to save you spiritually, not physically. See, Jesus didn't come to save your body. He came to save your soul. Who you are in your soul is who you really are. I don't care how well you look. I don't care how many pictures you got of your own self. But who Jesus came to save was your soul. You can have a beautiful body and an ugly soul. But God wants to transform that soul. He wants to save your soul and he wants to transform it. These people missed the servant while they looked for the soldier. They missed the servant while they looked for the soldier. No doubt the Messiah would do all the things that they were expecting, but in his timing. But when they saw Jesus on that cross, they were basically finished with him. They said, we don't have anything to do with you anymore. If you can't free us from these Romans, we don't have anything to do with you. Oh, but they missed the message. They missed why it was here. They didn't understand God's method of saving them. And that's where we get to our last point in this outline. Uh, they not only missed his mission, they misapplied the scripture's message, and they did not understand God's methods. Uh, God said, I, I came that you might be free. I came to give you life, not only life, but that you might have it abundantly, as we talked about in John 10, 10. But they expected a king and got a savior. Jesus truly came to set them free. But what does the Bible say? You should know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, if the truth will make you free, what will the lie do? It'll keep you enslaved. It'll keep you enslaved. And most people prefer the lie over the truth. That's so sad. 
understand how God wanted to save them. And those six hours on the cross, Jesus accomplished more than any conqueror in history. But they wanted a physical king. He defeated the most persistent and the most terrible of man's enemies. What are they? Death, sin, Satan, and hell. Took care of all of those for us the moment we accepted this work on the cross and the person whom he is. That's what God is saying. Now listen, don't let anybody lead you astray today. What you have is right now. You don't have tomorrow. If you read the obituary, babies, children, teenagers, young adults, they all die any day. And God says you can only accept him while you live. Salvation is not granted to the good. It's not granted to those that are diligent, to the hard workers, uh, to those who believe that they are holy than others. Uh, God said, now you don't even care if you say you're going to turn over a new leaf. Your mess is as filthy rags on the outside of God. You need a savior. A man that has no spot or no blemish. That man is Jesus Christ. God is saying, if you understood who my son really is and who he was when he came before you, you would have been shouting the victory knowing that in three days he's going to rise again. In three days he's going to rise again. That's what we're going to talk about on next Sunday. But God is saying, right now, do you understand who my son is? Have you made that choice? Have you ever been lost in sin? That's the problem. Most people don't think they're lost. They think that they can get by with what they have. And it's never enough. Have you ever confessed yourself to be a sinner before the Lord? Have you come to the place where you knew that you would never be saved apart from the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ? That's the question you must ask yourself. And God is telling us opportunities are being made right now. So if I come to a close, understand this. You have to turn your life around by turning to Jesus Christ. He's given you everything that he has. He performed the most amazing feat that any man has ever performed. Uh, he had the fatal torment, uh, but thank God there was the empty tomb. Thank God that he rose from the dead three days later. And right now he's calling you to come into his family. Finally on that terrible day, on the cross of Calvary, that day, that day finally ended. The torment that he had, both spiritually and physically. The life of his body, Jesus hung dead on that cross. But the blood that had poured over his body was coagulating down by his feet. And the awful death that he endured on that cross was mercifully over. And amazingly, these two men who were crucified with him were also dead. But one made the right choice. They, one represented history, the other represented bad history. It's good history and bad history. And you have to ask yourself, are you, are you on the right side of history? Because this is real. And God is saying, uh, the shouting finally stopped the day he died. But then when he rose again, that was a new shout for those that had accepted Christ as their personal Savior. They can really wave palms now to say that he is the victor. And he has taken the sting out of death. But you have to recognize why the shout. Why are you throwing palms at his feet? Why are you making a way for him? Do you really acknowledge him as the king of glory? Even his followers lost their shout because of the object of their affection was dead. Some of the disciples left him. And they went back to their old lives. But let me remind you, that came a day, as I said before, just three days later, when the shouting started up again. And God is saying, you too can shout that Jesus is the Savior of your soul. And he's given you a life that will never end. A life that will always be in his presence if you're shouting for the right reasons. God is saying, if you see on your hand out there, Luke 19 and 38, shouting, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. We can shout because God has worked it out. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we come before you once again with bowed heads and our hearts. We thank you for reminding us who you are and what you've done through your son, Jesus Christ. Reminding us of the opportunities that we have, not tomorrow, but today. Thank you, dear Father God. Allow your Holy Spirit to knock on the doors of the souls of those who have not given you the invitation, O oh God. Allow them to recognize that this is a day of opportunity. If they will accept the person of the Son, Jesus Christ, and they also accept his work on the cross. Yes. Right now, dear Father God, let them know that they can be saved for all eternity. For those of us who have accepted Christ and have muted our proclamation of his glory, Father God, ignite in us the fire that we have lost. Yes. Lead God and direct us throughout this day in the sweet and strong name of Jesus, I pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Amen, amen church, amen, and amen. The day the shouting starts.